Welcome to lesson 52 of your distance learning session for Geology of Basic Science with Kenneth, your symbol. Our lesson 52 will focus on revision and integration activities, number two. Under the revision and integration activities two, we have the outcomes. We will review the different topic that we have been the different topics that we have been handling, especially paleontology. Then we we'll look at revision, and we will get into some integration activities. Now we will review and answer multiple choice questions and essay questions related to paleontology. Now, paleontology, during our study, we saw the scoop of paleontology, the different types of fossils, conditions necessary for fossilization, modes of fossilization, then occurrence and uses of fossils, then gaps in fossil records, as well as fossil uh, uh, life and dead assemblages, as well as extinction in fossils. Then we saw classification of fossils, and we ended this topic with description of fossils. Now, on the scope of paleontology, we saw that paleontology is the study of past life called fossils. Past here simply is paleo, which is from the Greek word. This past could also be interpreted as ancient or uh, the past or ancient or urgent or old. Now, the main branches of paleontology include you have uh, botany, you have paleobotany, we have vertebrate and invertebrate paleontology, and then we have micropaleontology. We saw the different groups of fossils, that is, extant and extinct fossils. And fossil, in general, is a Greek word that means dug up from the ground. Therefore, fossils are those uh, Ancient organisms that are preserved in some sedimentary rocks. The different examples of fossils include organic traces, which are just impressions, and organic remains, which are likely referred to as true fossils. Then we have we also saw evolution of fossils, and we did underline that evolution of fossils is a gradual process and evolves from simple to complex form. So as the rocks become more simple or younger, the fossils become more complex. We saw the different types of fossils, which included zone fossils, index fossils, transported fossils, derived fossils, uh, trace fossils, fasci fossils, and ramine fossils. Now, we equally saw the different conditions necessary for fossilization, or the potentials that are put in place, or the chances for which organisms can be preserved as Fossils. Those are the different synonyms that are related to conditions necessary for fossilization. We said that preservation of organism is very, very a rare situation. So there must be some specificities that an organism will need to adopt in order to be uh, fossilized. Therefore, for an organism to be fossilized, that organism must have preservable parts. That is to say that organisms with hard parts will have higher chances of being preserved than organisms with soft parts. Then, barrier conditions. Organisms that are rapidly buried will be easily fossilized than 
those that are not rapidly buried. Then, the organism must have uh, must be in abundance. Now, if they are in abundance, they give more chances. They permit more chances of fossilization. As well as, when they are fewer, they have limited chances of being preserved as fossils. Then, they must be in some specific rock types. For example, sedimentary rocks, especially fine-grained rocks, and the chemically formed rocks are highly fossilized, while coarse grain sedimentary rocks and uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks have lesser chances or are not fossilized at all. They must be in a specific uh, environment and must be of specific size. Larger size organisms have lesser chances of fossilization, while small size organisms have high chances of being preserved as fossils. And these organisms that must be preserved must escape destruction after burial. Then they must be in environments where they, are, they can be fossilized. We have different sedimentary environments. We have continental, transitional, and marine environments. Now, modes of preservation of fossils. We grouped the different methods or the different modes or the different processes that guide organisms to be preserved as fossils into five different groups. The first group is that which has to do with conservation of entire organisms. That is, mummification, we have ambadization and we have refrigeration. We also have soft parts preserved but altered. That is the case where organisms are preserved as films or tin films. Then, uh, or soft parts are preserved as tin films. Then, conservation of original hard parts unaltered. This is the case where all the hard, the, 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 the hard parts are conserved, and this is true remains. We have carbonate remains, we have uh, siliceous remains, we have phosphatic remains, and we have woody tissues that are being preserved as fossils. Then we have hard parts preserved but altered. This way, carbonization has to come into play, the process of petrification, and then we have what? We have uh, replacement or mineralization. Then fossils preserved as traces of organism or organic activities. This way, we only find impressions or one burrows, or we have uh, tracks or traits. We have coprolites and gastrolites. And generally, we can have mold and cast. Occurrence of fossils. Under occurrence and fossils of fossils, we did say that fossils occur in particular rock types. And this is based on the mode of environment, the mode and the environment of formation of the rocks. This way, fossils can most likely be preserved in sedimentary rocks, not just in any kind of sedimentary rock, but the ones that are fine-grained. For example, you have sealed stones, we have mud stones, we have shells, and we have limestones, which are crystalline rocks. Then, coarse grain, as well as medium grain sedimentary rocks, are less fossilized. Not that they cannot be fossilized, but the chances for them to preserve fossils are very minimal. Then, fossils in igneous and metamorphic rocks are quite rare, or at times not even possible to be found. Because they are rocks that are formed under harsh conditions of temperature and pressures. So their environments through which they are being formed do not permit fossils to be preserved or organisms to be preserved as fossils. Uses of fossils. Fossils can be used as indicators of ancient climate. For example, corals will indicate um, uh, 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 will indicate uh, tropical environments. Then fossils can also be used as indicators of sedimentary environments. We did mention the fact that 
Organisms can be preserved in continental, transitional, and marine sedimentary environments. Fossils can also be used as stratigraphic indicators. That is where they are used to draw up the stratigraphic column. Then they, can, they are very useful to geologists. For example, paleontologists uh, 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 will use fossils to draw up evolutionary histories. And then, uh, petroleum geologists will use fossils to track out the different areas of fossil fuels. And then, we also have fossils as live and dead assemblages. As live assemblages, we mean that they are those organisms that lived in a common environment, died in that environment, and were preserved in that environment. So, they are preserved on the spot. Then, dead assemblages are those organisms that lived in a different environment. They were brought from the different environments to another environment where they were preserved. The reason for which we call them dead assemblages. Now, gaps in fossil records. We establish that many organisms have lived, but only a few of them left records. And the fact that fossil record is incomplete, then the organism's preservation is very selective. Then hard parts have greater chances of being preserved. So this way, it places a what? A destruction in the fossil record. Classification of fossils. Fossils in geology are classified based on their morphological and ecological aspects. This way, we can discover the mode of life under which organisms lived. And then, we can also understand the symmetry and the feeding conditions of the organism, as well as establish the environment, and then classify organisms based on morphological and ecological aspects. Then, we can also develop the cellular, tissue and the organic system and level of organization of an organism based on the morphological and the ecological aspects. These are the grounds on which we classify fossils. Therefore, we have common fossil groups, which we call phyla. We have phylum mollusca, phylum brachiopoda, phylum echinodermata, we have phylum atropoda, we have uh, Hemicodata and Selenterata. This guides us to description, the step for describing fossils. We highlighted that fossils, to describe a fossil, you need to state the morphological features that can guide you to know the phylum as well as the class. You state the external features which can guide you to the mode of life. And then you state the age or the age range of the fossil. And then you draw annotated diagrams as well as state the stratigraphic significance. Thus, we will we saw the different phy, uh, uh, phyla, and we saw phylum mollusca that was illustrated by the class bivalvia uh, with bivalves, and then uh, uh, cephalopods. Then we have gastropods. Then we have phylum brachiopoda that is illustrated using a brachiopod. Then phylum echinodermata illustrated using an echinoid, an echinoid which is possibly a regular echinoid. Then we have crinoids, also are under echinodermata that are illustrated using this diagram, which is partitioned to the arms, the the calyx the stems and the roots. Those are features that can guide you to identify that organism. Then you have phylum atropoda, illustrated using trilobite, that is the fossil calamine. Then we also have phylum hemicodata, illustrated using graptolites. This is an example of a true graptolite. We also have den uh, dendrograptolites, like the case that is uh, shown that is the case with circular and then cross bars. And the shape here is very important in their identifications. Then we have phylum colenterata. Colenterata is uh, illustrated using 
uh, corals. We have the different coral uh, classes, so classes. We have uh, Scleractina, we have um, Tabulata, and we have Rogus. So we shall dive into integration activities. And we're going to begin with uh, 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 paper one type, that is the MCQ type questions. Here, we have four, uh, for each question, we have four answers. Three are distractors, and only one is correct. There is no most correct answer. Only one is correct, and the rest are distractors. Question number one. Fossil with no living forms today are most likely to be A. Extant fossils B. Extinct fossils C. Index fossils D. Zone fossils Correct answer is B. Extinct fossils They have gone on extinction and they don't have living forms today Then which of the following environments will most likely ease fossil preservation? A. Deserts B. Beaches C. Cars D. Deep Sea The correct answer is D. Deep Sea Remember that deep sea are, you know, deep marine environments where deoxygenation is very important where there is quietness and where wave action is completely out of place. So it will permit better chances for preservation of fossils or of organisms. Question number three. When rocks get younger, fossils become A. Complex. B. Simple. C. Similar. D. Younger. The correct answer is A. We did say that in fossil evolution, the more the rocks are becoming younger, the fossils become complex. Then question number four. Fossils that provide information about the rock layer in which they are found are called A. Guide fossils. B. Excavation fossils. C. Restricted fossils. D. Indigenous fossils. The correct answer is A, guide fossils. They are also called index fossils as well as dynastic fossils. Question number five. Organic skeletal materials, on the line, organic skeletal materials, that produce many bone beds for fossils, uh, from fossils called A, ramine fossils, B, abraded fossils, C. Skeletal fossils. D. Key bed fossils. The correct answer is A. Remani fossils. Number six. Plant hard parts are composed of A. Sponges. B. Cellulose. C. Phosphates. D. Woody tissues. Our correct answer is B. Cellulose. Question number seven. Match the following mode of life of fossils. You have, you have conditions and then you have mode of life. You have background, you have floating, you have attached, and then you have cemented, you have also planktonic and boring. So in the light match, one will match C, that is background goes with boring mode of life. Then Floating goes with planktonic mode of life. Then attached goes with uh, uh, cemented mode of life. So a correct answer is D, 1C, 2B, 3A. Question number eight. Which type of dentition is uh, represented by fossil B? This is our diagram. Okay, A, taxodon, B, dizodon, C, chisodon, D, eterodon. Our correct answer is C, chisodon. Question number nine. Dentition in 
Fossil in fossil A is rudimentary and common with fossil genera like A. Maya, B. Blysmeris, C. Mytilus, D. Pectin. Our correct answer is A. Maya. Rudimentary simply means, you know, there are impressions that they are, but they are not really there. Question number 10. Oh, um, the drawing below shows types and theca growth from the secular in graptolites. Which parts, which parts labeled A, B, C, D, and E are standard and pendant types? A, A and B, B, A and E, C, B and C, D, C and D. The correct answer is B. A is scanning and E is pendant. Then we dive into paper two type questions. With paper two type questions, they are A type. And here we are supposed to express our understanding of the content of paleontology. So, we need to express as well as assess and develop and prove our know-how of the knowledge in paleontology. A. Explain the suitability of the following environments of fossilization. Roman 1, continental shelf. Roman 2, abyssal zone. Roman 3, littoral zone. Roman 4, uh, uh, land, and then five lakes. Online five uses of fossils. Now we get to the first part of the question. Explain the suitability of the following environments of fossilization. The first one was continental shelf. Continental shelves, uh, continental shelf is very favorable for fossilization. Reason being that there is abundance of organisms that will live or that thrive in this zone. And then there is also rapid accumulation of sediment. Therefore, there should be rapid barrier. Then next, a visceral zone is favorable for fossilization, but less effective uh, compared to the continental shelf. Why? Because organisms are less abundant. And then, planktonic organisms are destroyed by bentonic uh, forms which are or which act like scavengers. Then the conditions are less favorable in the littoral zone. Why? Because of attrition and abrasion by waves. And then also here there is constant shifting of sediments by currents due to the presence of what? Uh, uh, therefore, distracting the rapid uh, barrier or prevent rapid barrier of sediment. And the whole thing here is that there is wave action. Then fossil uh, fossilization is rare on land. Why? There is no rapid barrier. Then also there is accumulation of sediment uh, uh, which is distracted. Therefore, there is no rapid barrier. And therefore, the organisms are exposed to scavengers. Then, in land, rapid barrier is only achieved during a major flood or sandstorms or in a marshy area or in tar pools or in, uh, or in resin. Then, in lake environments, uh, fossilization is favorable because barrier is achieved for sediments. And then, um, there is also barrier of sediments is less favorable as compared to the sea environments. Then, uh, outline five uses of fossils. Of course, fossils can be used, uh, this is specifically to a geologist, can be used for correlation and dating of rocks of different localities. It can be used to establish the geologic time scale. 
Then you have microfossils are most likely used as hideouts or areas for tracking down fossil fuel. Then they are used to determine evolutional changes of organisms. And they are used also to determine the paleo climate as well as the paleo environment. Question number two. Describe the, the variations in the following features of trilobites. You have the fascial suture, the pygidium, and the general angle. Here, diagrams are very important. So to approach, the first is the fascial suture. It can be described as proparian, gonadoparian, and opistoparian. And then, you realize that Opistoparian is the case where the fascia suture cuts the genna, uh, cuts uh, through the inner side of the eye. Then, um, uh, uh, cut, cuts through the posterior margin. And then you have proparian where the fascia suture cuts the lateral margin. And the gonatoparian where the fascia suture cuts the genna angle. Then, the pygidium. We compare the size of the pygidium and the cephalon. Uh, pygidium, when smaller than the cephalon, is described as micropagos, and when uh, the same size, it is described as isopagos, and when larger than the cephalon, it is described as macropagos. That is the diagrammatic illustration of the different types of pygidium descriptions. Then, based on the general angle, we have it that they are commonly drawn out into general spines as in paradoxite, and then the case where there is additional spines, as in mirapis, uh, and then the case where it is rounded. Question three. Based on shell form, state six characteristic differences between bivalves and brachiopods. Now, bivalves have, uh, are in equilateral, while brachiopods are equilateral. Then the bivalves have no foramen, Why uh, brachiopods have a foramen. And then uh, most uh, bivalves forms are equivalent. Why um, most uh, brachiopods are uh, in equivalent. Then for bivalves, they have no pedicle. Uh, uh, they have no pedicle, but some possess a byssus, which is used for attachment. Then for brachiopods, they have both a, ped a pedicle and a brachial uh, valves that are used for attachment. Then for bivalves, they use the siphon for feeding, while for brachiopods, they use the lophophor. And then the bivalves, they will use, uh, they, are, they have a calcareous shell, while brachiopods have both a chitinous in uh, articulate shell and a calcareous articulate shell. Bivalves have folds and circles. Uh, bivalves do not have uh, 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 folds and circles, but brachiopods have folds and circles. Then the intestine in bivalves open into an anus. Why for brachiopods? Uh, for brachiopods, the intestine for articulate and blindly, and for inarticulate, the intestine and or uh, opens into an anus. Then for bivalves, there is a presence of the pallial line and pallial sinus, which is absent for brachiopods. So this way we have come to the end of our lesson. Our next lesson will be uh, on map work. That is orientation and direction of maps, uh, on maps.